Hi, uh, I'm Rodrigo Luger. I'm a Flatiron Fellow at the Center for Computational Astrophysics in New York. And today I'm going to be giving mostly a pedagogical talk on linear models and how they can be used to model systematics and test data and, and in other um, time series data as well. Um, I've done a lot of this work for the Kepler and K2 missions, but it's also applicable to tests. So I want to spend most of the talk um, just focusing on linear models, what they are and how to use them, and, and motivating them as a very powerful way to, to tackle systematics modeling in, in test data. So the way that I typically think about a, a data set, a time series observation of, of stellar fluxes, is that it's some draw from some unknown distribution. Right? There's always uncertainty in your measurement. Um, there's always Poisson noise. There might be correlated noise either due to the star or the detector. And so the observation you make is really a draw from some distribution. Normally, um, or usually, we make the assumption that this distribution is a Gaussian. And so that's um, characterized by this script N for normal distribution. Um, and a Gaussian is uh, a simple but extremely powerful distribution um, with many convenient properties that we're going to explore today. And it's characterized by a mean vector, mu, and a covariance matrix, sigma. And so in general, this, this is the notation for multidimensional Gaussian, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Now, this mean, mu, uh, is usually a combination of the things you care about and the things you don't care about. In this case, whatever the star is doing or whatever the physics is that you're interested in, such as the transit model or stellar rotation, stellar pulsations, whatever it may be, and the component due to systematics, due to the detector, due to the telescope. If you're observing from the ground, it's due to the atmosphere. And that's typically the thing that we want to correct for, uh, detrend, marginalize. There are different ways to approach this, which we're going to talk about. And then the covariance, there's also different ways to approach this. But in the simplest case, the covariance is characterizing your measurement of certainty. And so in the simplest case, which is uh, probably also the most common, is to assume that sigma is a diagonal matrix. And it's a co covariance. So the entries in the diagonal are just the squares of the standard deviation, or the squares of the measurement of uncertainties at each cadence. So that's the simplest way to, to, to think about this multidimensional Gaussian distribution for your data. Now, like I said, um, the thing that we're really interested in at the end of the day is this mu star, which is the physics. Right? In this case, I have a transit model. Right? We want to be able to characterize something about the transiting planet. But in order to do that, we have to model the systematics. And um, in this case, um, this here is scattered light due to the Earth and the moon entering the detector. But there's also other kinds of systematics. There's jitter. Um, there's various detector effects that end up contributing to the flux we observe. And then sigma here can either be just Poisson noise. You could also um, implement a Gaussian process. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, um, maybe to model either detector noise or stellar noise, right? So stellar rotational modulation, you want to maybe model that out so that you can better model the transit and better characterize the planet. But for now, I'm just going to focus on these mu terms um, and specifically on this mu underscore test term, which is our systematics model. And the simplest way to model this is with the linear model. And what do I mean by that? Um, I'm modeling mu underscore tests as just a dot w, some matrix a dotted into a vector of coefficients w. Now, this matrix a is typically called the design matrix. It's a matrix characterizing how um, the properties of the noise or the properties of the detector, which are encoded in w, how they carry over into your measurement, into your flux that you observe. So maybe the simplest kind of linear model is just a polynomial model, where the columns of A are the components of the polynomial basis. And so in this case that I'm showing you here, this would be the, the setup for fitting a fourth degree polynomial to some data. And so in order to do this, the columns of my design matrix are just the the monomial terms, so the, a constant polynomial, linear, linear polynomial, quadratic, cubic, and quartic. And then the Ws are what actually encode the information about this particular measurement or this particular detector, right? This is characterizing its noise properties. And my model is just the, this dot product, 
So it's a linear combination of these basis components to get the polynomial that I observed. So this is how it would fit a fourth order polynomial to data is using this um, design matrix. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves whenever we're um, approaching a problem where we have systematics is whether we want to detrend or to marginalize. And I'll talk about the difference between those two in a second. Now, let's go back to this equation here, right? So remember the goal, the goal is to um, characterize something about the physics of the system. So in this case, mu underscore star. Um, however, we have this additive component here, which is systematics, which we don't know what they are. We want to remove them or correct for them. Now, we have two options. The first option, like I said, is to detrend. And this is the most common one. It's widely used in the literature. And it's to actually find out what the best fitting values of W are, right? The, the values of those coefficients that best fit the data and subtract them off. So I'm, I'm putting a hat over the, the best fitting values. So the maximum of posteriori solution for W. And um, that allows us to compute our best fitting linear model. We just subtract from the data and we get F prime, which, um, which I'm gonna call uh, the, the detrended light curve. Now, the other thing that we could do is to not detrend. So not do this pre-processing step where we correct our data but to just analyze the data as it is simultaneously, simultaneously modeling the physics and the systematics. Um, and specifically what you wanna do is you wanna marginalize over the nuisance parameters. Now, um, what that means is you're, you're, you're actually integrating over all the possible values of those nuisance parameters that are consistent with the data to infer something about the physics. Now, this is sometimes less satisfying to do because you don't actually get to see the detrended light curve. You don't actually get to get to produce a detrended light curve and then analyze it. And the reason is that there's no single detrended light curve. There's always uncertainty at every step of the, of the process where you're trying to detrend data. And so this is a this is a more Bayesian way of looking at the problem, where you have um, a distribution. You made a particular measurement from that distribution. And you want to learn something about the mean and the covariance of the distribution from your measurement. And so we'll, we'll talk about that next. Let's let's focus on detrending first. So, in order to find the best fitting values of W, what we need to do is we need to maximize our likelihood function. Now, since this talk is pre-recorded, I'm I've been a little liberal with math, so feel free to pause at any time to. To, if I'm if I'm going too fast, um, I'm, I also have references at the end of the talk uh, pointing to papers that discuss this in more detail. But all I have here is just the equation for a multidimensional Gaussian. Well, this is the probability distribution of our data. It's also what we call the likelihood, capital L. It's the likelihood of the data conditioned on our model. Now, if you don't believe me that this is just a multidimensional Gaussian. Recall the equation for a one-dimensional Gaussian. Um, it's something proportional to e to the minus one half x minus mu over sigma squared. In, in this case, everything here is a scalar. The equation at the top is just the multidimensional version of that, where here I have um, my measurement f. I'm subtracting the mean model, which in the equation down below is just mu. I'm transposing that vector, I'm dotting it into the inverse covariance matrix, which you can think of just one over uncertainty squared, which is exactly what I have down here. And then I'm dotting that into uh, data minus model again. And so I have two data minus model terms, that's data minus model squared divided by sigma squared. So this is this, this equation up top reduces to this one when you just have one dimension. Now, like I said, what we want to do is we want to maximize this equation, right? This is the equation for a Gaussian distribution, which is what we're assuming at the beginning of the day is that our data is distributed as a Gaussian. And in order to maximize this, we, what we can do is we can take the derivative uh, with respect to W and set it to zero and then solve for the value of W um, where that condition is true, right? Where we're trying to find the maximum. And so you, you find the point where the derivative is zero. I'm not gonna go through the math, I'm just gonna present the result. It's probably four or five lines of algebra. Again, I have um, references at the end. 
the solution you get, the cool thing is that there's a closed form for it. You can just write it down in terms of matrix operations. And so W hat, which again is the best fitting value of W, is just some big sandwich of matrices applied to um, the, the, your data minus the, the physics model. And so the cool thing that it, because it's closed form and because computers nowadays are so good at doing linear algebra, this is instant to evaluate for any reasonably sized data set. And so we have a closed form for W, for which are our weights, which lets us get a closed form for a linear model, which is this A dot W. And so this is it. This is the equation for the detrended light curve. Um, my previous papers on the Everest pipeline for the K2 telescope all used this. This is how I compute the detrended light curves. These, this is behind all the Everest light curves um, in the Everest catalog. So it's extremely efficient to do because it's just a linear model. However, there are two downsides to this. And the first one here on the left-hand side is that I, I alluded to this before, this is just a point estimate, right? I, I found the best value of the coefficients that characterize the data. I use that to detrend and I'm presenting you the single light curve that best um, characterizes my beliefs of what I think that light curve would be if the detector did not have systematics. In reality, there's no way to know that, right? I'm making a noisy measurement. I'm modeling a statistical process where I'm making several assumptions and modeling as a Gaussian. Um, and I only made one measurement of the light curve. And so there's always gonna be uncertainty there. I can propagate that uncertainty, right? I can, I can go through and give you error bars on what F prime is. But what's really happening here is um, this, this matrix sandwich operation that I did is actually correlating stuff. And so the, the actual uncertainty on my uh, detrended light curve is, is really characterized by a dense covariance matrix. And so um, it's not, often we simplify and, and say that, you know, that we can just carry over the error bars to our detrended light curve. But there is additional correlated noise there that's, that's more difficult to model if you just detrend ahead of time. Um, the other main drawback is if you've, if you've noticed, um, mu star, which is the thing we're interested in, is on the right-hand side of the, this equation. So in order to detrend the light curve, I need to know what the answer is ahead of time, which is, which is circular, right? That doesn't help me. Um, and the way to think about this is, in order to detrend, right, I'm fitting some kind of systematics model to the data and subtracting it off. Well, the data also includes, you know, transits, stellar variability, pulsations, whatever. Um, and I, when I do this, I risk having the systematics model fit out some of that stuff, right? If my systematics model is flexible enough, it might be able to fit out the transit or fit out some of the stellar variability. And so in order to do that properly, I need to subtract out that physics model first, fit the systematics model, subtract off the systematics model, then add the physics back in. But I don't know how to do that because I don't know the physics model ahead of time. And so that, this is a classical problem in detrending is how do you make sure that your systematics model isn't fitting out physics? Um, there, there are many approaches to, to, um, to addressing this. Um, for instance, what, it, what I would do in Everest is if we're interested in uh, transits, you mask them. You mask them when you compute your systematics model so that they never inform the fit and you never run any risk of detrending them out because the um, the data used to train the model doesn't include any transits. And so the model doesn't know about them, can't fit them out. Um, if you have an approximate model, or maybe if you have um, some idea of, so you could also approach this iteratively, right? So you could, you could detrend this, assuming that um, uh, your astrophysical model is zero. Um, you get an estimate for your detrended light curve, and then you do this again, and refine your estimate for the astrophysical model and so forth. So there are different approaches to this, but it is a drawback because you're doing this detrending in a pre-processing step. Now, the, the second option, which I talked about earlier, is to marginalize. Um, and from a Bayesian point of view, this is, this is more principled because you're simultaneously modeling these two things. There's no pre-processing step where you have to make these, these uh, approximations. And so if we're going to be Bayesian about it, 
uh, we need to think about priors. And so specifically, um, eventually what we're going to do at the end of the day is marginalize, integrate over the Ws, the unknown systematics. And so we want to place a prior on them. And the easiest prior to place is again, a multidimensional Gaussian with some mean M and some uncertainty or covariance matrix capital lambda. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to focus too much on this. Um, in most cases, uh, in the context of detrending, it doesn't really matter too much what your prior is. Your prior can be used for regularizing, for um, decreasing or increasing the strength or aggressiveness of the fit. And I, I talk a lot, a lot about this in my papers on Everest, again, with links at the end. Um, and so check those out if you're interested in. But this, this prior is essentially limiting how aggressive your systematics model can be, right? If, you're, if your covariance or your uh, variances for your Ws are very large, then those Ws can get very large and they can, the systematics model can get very large and fit out almost anything, often too aggressively. Now, the, the thing that this prior introduces is it's changed our likelihood function a little bit. So now our likelihood function has an extra term. So the, this first part here is the same as before. This is just the uh, equation for the Gaussian that's describing the probability of my data given my model. And then the second term here is my prior, right? So uh, it's, it's exactly the same equation, but um, the, the data here in this case are the weights W and um, the model is, is the prior here for, for W. So um, this is a lot of math, um, and I'm not going to go through all the steps, but the basic idea is that what we want to do at this step is I don't, I don't actually care about what W is, right? I, as, I, as I showed you earlier, I could go ahead and figure out the best fitting W use that can be the model and subtract it off. What I really want to do is I want to consider all the possible values of W, all the possible properties of the detector or coefficients modeling the properties of the detector that are consistent with the data that I observed and the priors that I, that I, that I have. And so in order to do that, what we want to compute is the probability of F given mu star, period, right? Not conditioned on W. I actually want to integrate over all the possible values of W. And so as a Bayesian, that, um, that procedure is called marginalization. Now, the cool thing is that it's analytic. Again, there's a closed form expression for what this integrated probability is. And it's a bit of math. I'm not going to show it here. Um, I wrote a research note with Dan Foreman Mackey and David Hogg a few years ago. Um, we didn't come up with this. This has widely been known. Um, but, it's an, but, but I go through the derivation there. So this might be useful uh, for some people. The cool thing here is that this is still just the equation for a Gaussian, but now this is marginalized over my noise model. You can see that there's no Ws showing up anywhere in this equation because I've integrated over them conditioned on my, my prior. The one thing that changed is my covariance matrix changed. Right? You can see that I now have this additive term here adding to my data covariance that's saying something about the covariance of the noise process, um, given what I believe the structure of that, that noise process to be encoded in this matrix A. Um, and so, um, like I said, this here is the equation for a Gaussian. And so this is the equation for my likelihood. And um, typically we, um, we like to, you know, get rid of the exponential there and talk about log likelihoods because they're slightly more convenient to deal with. And so your log likelihood is essentially just this term here, which is the term of the Gaussian plus some constants. There's an asterisk there. Um, you should check out this paper if, if, if you're interested in this. But the, the basic idea is that my expression for my log likelihood marginalized over the systematics model is fairly simple. And it's the same as my likelihood conditioned on a particular value of the systematics model, except that I have this extra term here. And if you, if you think about what's happening here is we've actually taken our linear model and we've turned it into a Gaussian process. And specifically we turned it into a Gaussian process with a covariance matrix given by this. So this operation here where I'm sandwiching my prior on my weights in between my design matrix, 
that's the that's the covariance matrix of the Gaussian process um, implied by my linear model. And so it's really cool. That this is a very, very close relationship between linear models and Gaussian processes. And because this is a Gaussian process, this is now this is now essentially encoding the fact that um, there's an infinite number of detrended light curves. There's an infinite number of ways to interpret the data because you, you observe that data with uncertainty. And this is marginalizing over them. So this likelihood is actually integrating over all those possibilities to give you the, um, essentially your best estimate for the probability of your data given your model is without thinking about any of the nuisances. Like I said, this is slightly less satisfying because now you have a likelihood and you can use this likelihood, say, in a, in a Markov chain Monte Carlo, or you can do a grid search to infer things about your, um, your physics model. But at no point do you have a detrended light curve that you can point to and say, oh, here's the transit in the detrended light curve. You can, you can always compute that in, in, in a separate step, but fundamentally, we're talking about likelihoods here. And so the, the procedure here is you deal with the raw data. Um, you define some kind of model. So in this case, so if we're talking about exoplanet transits, it would just be a transit model. Um, you have some matrix A that's characterizing your noise. We're going to talk about how to compute A in a second. Um, and that's it. And so for different values of the parameters describing mu, you can compute likelihoods. And then you can do posterior inference, and you can figure out um, you know, posterior probability distributions for the transit depth or the transit uh, um, duration, et cetera. Um, where, where you've propagated all the uncertainty um, in, in, in the way that's most consistent with your knowledge of the problem. One of the other advantages of doing this is that it's especially important when the signal that you're looking for is very small. Right? When the signal to noise of your measurement is very small and your signal is buried in the noise, small decisions you make about how to model the noise can matter a lot. And so one example of um, where this has been applied before was in K2 data. So this is work that I did on the TRAPPIST-1 system. Um, so this was in 2017, um, TRAPPIST-1H, which is the outermost planet in the system, had only been seen to transit once. Um, and so it wasn't yet confirmed as a planet. We didn't know what its period was. Um, and, fortunate, and so th this was all done with ground-based data, data and Spitzer data. But fortunately, K2 pointed that TRAPPIST-1. Unfortunately, there was an ins there was, it's a faint star, and there was a lot of correlated noise due to the detector. And we had reason to believe that there was one of the transits of TRAPPIST-1H fell in this region here. Now, by eye, um, it's very hard to figure out where that transit might be. There are um, several things that it could be transits, but it's not at all obvious. Um, it turns out that I believe the transit is right here. You might see a very, very small uh, dip in the light curve there. Um, but the, the point here is that if I, this is the raw data, by the way, but the point here is that if I detrended this data without knowing where the transit of TRAPPIST 1H was, that transit would get washed out, right? And unless I had a very carefully regularized um, model for the systematics that I removed, that systematics model would eat the transit because it's so low signal to noise. Now I could have, um, but, but if, if my systematics model is not very aggressive, then it won't remove much of the noise and you won't be able to find the transit anyways. So we found that the, the best way, in fact, the only way that we were able to actually find the planet was to uh, marginalize over the systematics model and simultaneously solve for the planet um, period and properties together with the, well, simultaneous model that and the systematics model marginalizing over the systematics. And so that enabled us to actually um, to find four transits of TRAPPIST 1H at the time and, and confirm it as a planet and, and identify its um, orbital period. So um, I encourage you to think about uh, whether detrending or marginalizing is the, is the right approach for you. Um, again, there are links at the end if you're more interested in this marginalization approach. Now, I've talked a lot about 
you know, linear models, oh, you have some design matrix A that characterizes your, your noise model. But I haven't talked about how do you find what this matrix A is. There are many different ways. This matrix encodes uh, your beliefs about what the noise is allowed to do in your data set. The simplest one, like I said, is some kind of generic polynomial basis, right? So if you have an infinite number of polynomials, your design matrix and your linear model can model anything, right? That's Taylor's theorem. The same is true for an infinite number of sines and cosines. Um, it's just the Fourier expansion of, 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 your, of your data. And so if you have some low order uh, modes in your data that are maybe due to a changing illumination pattern on the detector or some thermal effect that that is some some lower polynomial this is this is probably a good approach so this is just a generic you have some some um, low order polynomials use as your basis and then you can um, use the equations in the previous slides to either find the best fitting polynomial or to marginalize over this polynomial systematics model Often though, especially with tests, we have more information. Um, we kind of know what, this, what the detector is doing because we have so many observations of, of stars. And so that's, oh, and by the way, so if you wanna do this in, in Python, um, it's extremely easy. So um, to build up a matrix of polynomials, you use the NumPy Vander function. Um, unfortunately, no relation, I think, to, to Andrew. Um, it's, uh, it's short for Vandermond matrix. And all that is, is um, given an array, it returns a matrix where the columns of that matrix are the array, the array squared, the array cubed, and so forth. And so um, I encourage you to try this out using the equations of the previous slides, um, fit a polynomial to, uh, to data using a linear model and using the matrix operations in the previous slides. It's a, it's, a, it's a good exercise to learn how to do this. Now, like I said, so usually we know more about the detector than just you know, the generic polynomial terms. And that's the idea behind co-trending basis vectors, or CBVs, which is a, essentially a principal component analysis approach to modeling noise. And this is what's done. It was done in Kepler. It's done in TESS in the uh, pre-search data conditioning PDC light curves they remove these co-trending basis vectors. Now here I'm plotting um, the first 16 CBVs for a particular test sector, channel, and camera. Um, the way these are computed is you just look at the variation of all stars or a large number of stars across the detector. Um, on average, um, the things that you, the, the main modes of variation that you're seeing are due to the detector because they all stars are rotating at different frequencies. They have planets at different um, ephemerises. Um, and so when you do PCA on a large number of stars, what, what, you, um, what you get out at the end are these modes of variation that are common to all stars. That's almost certainly detector systematics that you can then remove. And the cool thing is that you essentially now get a basis of terms that you can put into a linear model and either use to detrend or to marginalize. And I, I have a link down here to the light curve package, which is an extremely powerful package for, for doing this kind of, for accessing test data, but for also doing detrending and systematics corrections. And so in light curve, um, it's very easy to download the test CBVs if you have light curve installed. And there's in fact a CBVs to design matrix function that converts these CBVs into a nice A design matrix that you can just um, use in a linear model. Um, here's just a quick example, again, just taken from the light curve docs, where um, in gray up here, we have the original light curve. In blue, um, let's just focus on the blue curve. In blue, we have um, one of the uh, co-trending basis vectors, and you can see that all the stars on the detector have this exponential decay right at the beginning of the pointing. Um, and so uh, we can remove that because we know that's systematics. And, we use a linear model and we get the black curve. And so again, um, check out the light curve docs for more information on how to do this. They have several examples. Um, another 
uh, linear model, which is one I've used a lot, is um, pixel level decorrelation. And this is uh, an idea that was first introduced by Drake Deming in a paper in 2015 for Spitzer data. And I later adapted to um, Kepler and K2 data in, in my Everest papers. And so um, Everest doesn't um, work out of the box for tests, but light curve, again, has implementations of PLD that can be used out of the box on test data. We'll talk about that in a second. Very briefly, the way PLD works is um, is essentially this. So, you know, the light from any individual star is um, um, collected on, uh, the, the PSF spans many pixels. And so the light is present on many pixels. And each of those pixels um, encodes the physics, right? So if you're looking at a planet transit, that planet transit is going to be in all the pixels, albeit at different signal to noise, right? Smaller signal to noise and the dimmer pixels. This is in an ideal world. Um, in the real world, the detector and the telescope is moving with respect to the sky. Maybe it's uh, in, in K2, this was drift. In tests, um, this could be jitter. This motion could be on a much shorter time scale. But the idea is that if there's motion, then um, any individual pixel is going to experience either an increase or a decrease in flux. And so you're introducing a slope there or some, or some strange function, depending on what the detector is doing. And so now any individual pixel has the transit, but it also has some kind of component due to the motion of the, de the detector. And when you do simple aperture photometry and you add these all up, you now get a, um, uh, a noisy estimate. Now you have correlated noise uh, in addition to your transit. The insight with PLD is that um, even though you have different systematics in each of the pixels, you can see that some are going up, some are going down, the transit is still present in each of those pixels at the same level, right? So multiplicatively, the transit is still there with the same fractional depth in every pixel. And so the insight in PLD is, well, we can just, what, if, what would happen if we just divided each of these pixels by the total flux? And what would happen is this, you actually end up, if you divide each of the pixels by the total flux, remember these are the pixels, as well as the total flux, have the transit in them at the same depth. If you divide these two, you get terms in each of the pixels that no longer have the transit in them because the, the division operation, essentially you cancel out the, the transit model or, in, or more generally the physics model cancels out because of that division. And so now what you have is several vectors in each of the pixels that tell you something rather convoluted about your systematics model and nothing about your transit model. And so that makes it um, that makes it an ideal candidate for terms in a design matrix. And so the way that this works in PLD is that the design matrix is just assembled. Its columns are just these terms, the normalized pixels. The cool thing there, like I said, is that these don't have any transit information in them. And so you don't risk fitting out the transit by using this basis. Um, I mentioned this earlier. So Light curve again implements this in a very simple but efficient manner. Um, it's the PLD corrector. So check it out if you want to apply this to test data. Um, one other um, one other tool that's very recent is um, linearized fielded blending. This is a paper by Christina Hedges and, and, and myself that just came out. Um, one of the problems with PLD is that it's um, its core assumption is that the transit is present at every at the same level in all the pixels, which is only true if the target is isolated. There are no if there's no crowding, there's no contaminating sources, because those change the transit depth in each of the pixels. And so um, this is one of the reasons that I haven't put too much time into applying Everest to tests. It's because crowding is more of an issue. Um, and this is where linearized field deblending blending comes in. Um, this is an idea to model the, the scene, the actual um, PSFs of the, of the stars on the detector uh, in a fully uh, linear way. Um, so this example here, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I, I encourage you to check out the GitHub repository as well as the paper. But the idea here, this was applied to Kepler, but the idea is the same for tests, is that this particular target, according to Gaia, consists of two sources of similar magnitude 
and they're on the same pixel or within a pixel of each other in Kepler. And so if you were to apply PLD to this, it would fail because these pixels are encode, encoding the transit with different depths. However, if you carefully model the scene, the PSF, the positions of the targets, um, you can de-blend this, um, this, uh, this measurement and get separate light curves for each of the targets. So in black here, we have the original um, SAP photometry for this target. You can see that there's a transit, but there's no way to know whether this transit's coming from the orange or the blue star. But with LFD, um, it very naturally figures that out, right? So the blue star is constant and the transit is, um, is a, across the orange star. And I just wanna emphasize, this is a fully linear model. And the way it works is it learns the PSF from the entire, um, from an entire channel on the detector, from the behavior of all the sources. And then it solves for the positions and fluxes in each of the targets linearly at every cadence. So check that out. Um, and then finally, the last example that I wanted to give is also by Christina Hedges. It's test backdrop. It's another linear model, but this time um, applied to modeling uh, background scattered light in test data. And so um, the, if you look at a camera uh, or a, a channel on the detector in tests, you can see that there are large scale variations, edge effects due to the optics. Um, you might be able to see vertical bars due to straps on the detector, as well as uh, various other uh, scattered light, various other effects in the background. Uh, test backdrop builds a linear model for that very efficiently, subtracts that off. And so it's very useful for doing your own FFI um, analysis. Um, so I encourage you to check that out as well. Um, here's just an example of, um, this is from the documentation. Um, the original um, light curve and then detrended with uh, test backdrop. And you can see that the, uh, the scatter uh, decreased substantially just by properly modeling that background component. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, just a quick case study of a linear model that I've applied to test data. And this is a paper that I wrote uh, two years ago now on, um, on scattered light from the earth. Um, it was actually an April Fool's paper, but the science in it is, 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 uh, is legit, I promise. Um, and so as many of you know, um, earth shine uh, can be a problem at times. At times it can be a big problem um, because the earth and the moon sometimes come close to the field of view of tests. Um, rarely do they enter it. I think in this case that actually did just happen, but it's rare. Uh, more often, um, the earth is just above the sunshade. And so there's, there's paths of light that can actually reflect internally um, in the camera hood and illuminate the detector non-uniformly in a time variable way. And this can introduce a lot of correlated noise in the background of test pixels. I I'm part of what I do is um, modeling light curve variations to infer what um, what stars and planets look like. So I actually can map their surfaces. And so I thought this was a good opportunity to try to map the earth using tests. And so here, uh, this is back in 2018, I believe. This is one um, sector of test data, actually uh, two sectors of test data where the earth was above the edge of the sunshade. And this is what the tests, um, Test wasn't pointed at the Earth, but it was pointed toward the, the Earth. Was in was essentially uh, above the edge of the detector, and this is what Tess would have seen. And so you see the Earth rotating. You see the Earth at different phases. Tess is on a um, on an eccentric inclined orbit, uh, so it's actually seeing various phases of the Earth on any on any individual orbit. And the distance between uh, Tess and the Earth is changing dramatically uh, again because it's an eccentric orbit. And so all of this ends up causing uh, significant systematics. And you can see here, what I've done is I've just taken um, several thousand, um, like uh, several thousand postage stamps um, in various uh, channels of the test detector. And I've looked just at the background component and I categorized them into different modes of variation. And so each of the columns here are different, are 
each entry is a light curve. Each of the columns are different groups according to how similar those light curves are. And so you can see that all of them include this kind of um, periodic component, these up and down wiggles. Um, that is the Earth rotating. The frequency of um, this variation is exactly 20, well, it's a sidereal day, so it's 23 hours, um, 56 minutes. Um, and so we're actually seeing the phase curve of the Earth. However, you can see that um, these, 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 and especially these, all encode that information differently. And that's because while the, they're all seeing the same Earth, the path of the light rays to each of the pixels on the detector is different and the optics change things. And so things get really messy because you're, you're observing the same signal, but it's modulated by systematics that is extremely variable both in time and spatially on the detector. So I thought this was a great idea to, to do something like PLD, to separate systematics from physics. And so this is what this is what my data looks like, right? These are all the background light curves and the highest signal from those pixels on the test detector. And again, they all have that astrophysical component, which is the Earth component. Uh, it's the same in each of them. But what's different is the systematics component, right? It's modulated differently in each detector. And so I applied PLD to this, the linear model. And I was able to get a good fit. So I use my uh, starry package for modeling light curves and phase curves of, of planets. And at the end of the day, what I was able to infer is this. So the, the top shows my inferred map of the surface of the Earth. In fact, what we're really sensitive to is the clouds, because that's the most reflective um, component of the Earth in the test band. Um, and down here, this is uh, real data. So this is based on satellite data that was contemporaneous, um, averaged over the, the one month over which the data was taken. And it's also at a higher resolution. But the cool thing is, although these look different to the eye, you can see that the brightest regions on, my, on the inferred map are here, uh, here, and here. And the, the brightest one is right here, which uh, corresponds to actual monsoon clouds over Southeast Asia back in 2018. We have clouds over the Congo um, and clouds over the Andes and the Amazon. And so even though there's quite a bit of noise and the resolutions are different, we were actually able to infer the cloud patterns on the Earth um, just from background light and tests with a linear model. And so I actually was able to construct a movie as well um, this is much harder to do. Uh, I don't entirely trust this, um, but one of my goals is to, to continue to model this um, with additional data from more uh, test orbits in which the Earth was in view to refine this and maybe look for seasonal variations. But this is just one example of what you can do with a linear model for the systematics. That's all I wanted to, to share. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, here are the references for everything that I talked. Please do uh, check me out on GitHub. My email is rodluger at gmail.com. Please email me if you have any questions. Uh, and I look forward to joining you in the panel in a couple of weeks. Thank you.